I think, again, with the sirens going all off over the Chicago area, I think a lot of people are not tuned in right now. But anyway, the show must go on. Absolutely. So for those of you who are here, welcome. I'm Scott Warner. I'm president of the Culinary Historians of Chicago. And uh, for years, I've been trying to get our speaker, uh, Alex Prudhomme. Alex, um, as, as, um, as you know, uh, wrote with his aunt, uh, My Life in France. So years ago, I tried to get him uh, to speak. And uh, what, what year would that have been, Alex? To it probably was uh, 2006, 2007. Yeah. yeah. Even after the movie Julie and Julia came out, that would have been 2009. No, this was even this was even before you know when yeah. the book first so. came out, and because we were doing our programs live, then we had to coordinate with when our speakers would be in the Chicago area. Alex, I think, was going to be in the Chicago area at the same time we already had a speaker scheduled. So too much of a good thing, and we couldn't have him. And now my my dream has come true. I I finally was able to nab him for his latest book, Dinner with the President. Um, and I told Alex that if if his aunt were alive today, the tables might be turned because instead of Alex being known as the the uh, nephew of Julia Child, Julia Child could be known as the the uh, the aunt of Alex Prudhomme. His book is so masterfully written. Dinner with the President. Uh, it's 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 history. It's politics, it's diplomacy, it's about food history, it's it's so many, many things. And I'm a food writer myself. And I want to tell Alex that when I when I grow up, I want to write like he does. So it's <laughs> it's, it's just masterful. So uh anyway, um Alex, um well Alex, would you tell a little bit about your background yourself, just a little bit about what you're doing. And uh, you know, I will ask you a question. We're going to open this up to chat questions when it's over, but maybe when you're telling this, well, you can decide this now or after you're through speaking, uh, but I would like to know how you researched this book, because I can't imagine the massive, massive amount of research and how you wove all this together to, so that it's such a quick, and I said, I said it's a breathless read, uh, you can't put the book down. So on that note, uh, Alex, the the uh, the famous uh, nephew of Julia Child, uh, it, please uh, take take the show on. And if I disappear, if you see a black cloud coming my way in the background, Lake Michigan is right behind me. So it means that I've fled for my life and the show will go on. Anyway, Alex, take it away. Well, that's a dr dramatic introduction. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> uh, well, hello, everybody. Um, I hope you're all safe and sound out there. Uh, my name is Alex Prudhomme. And as Scott said, um, uh, I've, I'm not only a Julia Child's grand nephew, but I've been a writer for about 30 years. Um, I have uh, began my career writing in magazines here in New York City. Um, I was a uh, Time Magazine, a People Magazine. I wrote, I've written uh, freelance for the New Yorker and Vanity Fair and the New York Times. Um, but uh, in the last couple decades, I've been doing books. I wrote a book uh, with Julia called My Life in France. It was her memoir about her favorite years of life uh, when she went with her husband, Paul. Uh, to Paris in 1948, and he was working in the embassy there as a cultural attaché, and Julia was a diplomatic spouse and uh, had never been to France, uh, didn't know how to cook. Uh, they arrive on November 3rd, 1948, and um, unload their Buick station wagon and drove to Paris, and along the way, they stopped in Rouen, uh, the famous town where Joan of Arc was burned at the stake and uh, had a, 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 an epiphany, a lunch at La Couronne, which means the crown, and it's the oldest restaurant in France, and it's still there. Uh, it was built in the 1300s, and, um, and that was the meal that changed her life, and she got uh, fell in love with French cooking and uh, went to the Cordon Bleu, learned how to cook, began to teach classes in her apartment with her French friends, and eventually they put a book together, which came out in 1961, called Mastering the Art of French Cooking. Uh, and it so happens that I was born that year, 
And so that book and I have grown up together. The book is still in print and I'm still around. Um, and I was very lucky to work with Julia at the end of her life uh, when she was uh, 91 years old, uh, writing about the favorite years of her life. It was really a special experience. And I had to be a bit of a ventriloquist and kind of write in her voice. Most of the time I write in my own voice. And so um, uh, Scott asked about uh, how I researched and wrote this book. Um, it was partly inspired by Julia because it turns out that uh, she spent quite a bit of time at the White House. She also made two televised uh, documentaries of state dinners, first in 1970, 1967 with LBJ, who hosted Prime Minister Sato of Japan, and then nine years later, 1976, when Gerald Ford hosted Queen Elizabeth and Prince Philip for the bicentennial. Um, and they were very different events. I can tell you more about them later if you'd like. Um, and uh, I, this got me interested in the larger subject of food at the White House. And so I started doing some research. And in 2016, I was invited to the White House to give a talk about a book I wrote on fresh water and why I think it's going to be the defining resource, resource of this century. And uh, I gave it to the mid-level staff at the Obama administration. I had a friend who was in the staff and he invited me for lunch uh, at the Navy Mess, which is the cafeteria on the ground floor of the White House, right next to the Situation Room. And then he said, well, let's go on a quick tour. The Obamas were off on Martha's Vineyard and the house was empty and shadowy and we whipped around and I saw the uh, the state dining room and the Oval Office and the kitchen at work. And, um, you know, walking through those halls, seeing the busts and the portraits of the presidents and the first ladies, uh, looking at all the beautiful White House china, uh, being in those rooms that I had seen in photographs really hit me emotionally. And I wasn't expecting that. Um, and... Uh, I felt the history come alive. And I think that the seed for this book was planted then. But I was in the middle of other things and I didn't get started on the book until the fall of 2018. I planned to spend about two, two and a half years working on it. And I was making great progress uh, when suddenly COVID hit. Um, I had been looking, I'd gone and visited some of the presidential homes. I'd been to the White House on a, a tour. I had... Uh, Spent time at the Smithsonian and the Library of Congress. Uh, had doing, done a ton of reading. If any of you are presidential aficionados, you know that there's a tsunami of information out there about the presidents. And so I was weaving all of this together, uh, interviewing experts, uh, and and suddenly COVID hit, and everything came to a screeching halt. Uh, and we didn't know what we were dealing with. We didn't have a timeline. We it was just a blank. And so, uh, but I was had a lot of momentum going on. And so I um, I was able to get some of my sources to send me things either through the mail or electronically. And of course, I could still use the phone, uh, but it was a much slower process. Oh, and then when the book was done, uh, we had another problem, which is that there was this tremendous backlog and we couldn't get printing presses. There was no paper. There was no uh, trucks to deliver the books. It was sort of a 19th century problem. Uh, but we finally, the book came out this past February, right before President's Day. And I've been uh, talking about it ever since. Alex, I'm going to interrupt for a second. Yep. I just have to depart for a second. The sirens have gone off and I just have to check the TV. Hopefully I can stay here. So okay. keep going. Okay. Uh, so that, that's how I uh, wrote the book. Uh, once COVID lifted, I was able to finish it off and and uh, we got it uh we got it out to the bookstores and and it's been, you know, a lot of fun to talk about in the last uh couple of months. Um, and so that's that story. Um, and I guess since Scott is gone, maybe I'll begin with my presentation and uh, he will return at some point. And I, I think I'll talk for 40 or so minutes. Oh, Kathy is that's back. Fine. Go ahead. Go ahead. Okay. You're fine. And, um, uh, and then I'll be happy to take some questions. Um, and uh, I look forward to that. So um, so I'll just start my talk. Um, so, uh, the, the book, as you see, is called Dinner with the President, Food, Politics, and a History of Breaking Bread at the White House. And it's really 
a narrative history. Hi, it's a narrative history of the presidency, but viewed through the lens of food. And um, I became interested in the White House as a, as a character itself in the book, really, uh, because it, it really it, it's been there since John Adams uh, was the first president to live there. George Washington planned the White House, uh, cited it, uh, but did never live there uh, and never was inside of it. Uh, so the White House has been there pretty much from the beginning. So like any house, the White House runs on food. But 1600 Pennsylvania Avenue is a unique building. At once the nerve center of the country, a busy office, a decorative arts museum, uh, an actual home, and as Jackie put it, an emblem of the American Republic. The executive mansion is the most powerful house in the world, and so it follows that the meals and food policies created there are among the tastiest and most influential in history. In the same vein, the president is both a symbol of the nation and a flesh and blood human being. His food choices bridge those dis disparate roles. What he eats determines his health and sets an example for the nation. How his food is prepared, by whom, and the context of his meals transmits his values and priorities. His food policies and the way he pulls governmental levers influences the flow of goods and services to millions of Americans and billions of people around the world. His messaging about food touches on everything from personal taste to local politics, global nutrition, economics, science, war, race, class, gender, religion, and the like. As a result, the personal and political spheres of the White House are separated by a very thin membrane. From a bowl of cereal in the private quarters to a cabinet lunch, sometimes screaming children at the Easter egg roll, or a state dinner for royalty. Food is usually at the center of things, yet we tend to overlook that plain fact. Now a meal at the White House is never simply a meal. It's both sustenance and metaphor, a forum for the politics and entertainment at the highest level, a series of signs, signals, and stories. Consider Ronald Reagan's jelly beans. His love of the colorful candies explains how he weaned himself from tobacco, judged people's character, deflected scrutiny with folksy humor, turbocharged the sugar industry, and provided a useful way to communicate with, vo with voters. The candies seem to say, I like this food, you like this food, so vote for me. And people paid attention to that message. But the sweets, suddenly turned sour when Reagan labeled ketchup a vegetable and defunded the school lunch program by one and a half billion dollars. The message that time seemed to be that real vegetables are not as important as sweet substitutes, and he was ridiculed from all sides and backed off. So when you're the president, every bite counts, for better and for worse. In writing this book, I was struck by how some first families seem to intuit how food and entertaining are, are useful political tools, while others are clueless. The canny leaders like Thomas Jefferson, the Roosevelts, and Kennedys understood that their choice of guests, menus, and entertainment can amplify their agenda. Less savvy men, such as John Adams, Andrew Johnson, or Gerald Ford, discovered that a dull party, drunken speech, or food fail can undermine their legacy. So this book was inspired by such stories, along with the televised documentaries I mentioned about state dinners that Julia Child made in 1967 and 1976. Now this is the one in 76 when she's talking to Chef Holler, who's making a delicious lobster dish uh, for Queen Elizabeth and President Ford. And you'll note if you look closely that Julia is in her bare feet uh, because she stood a little over 6'2 and Holler was about 5'4" and she just didn't want to tower too much over him, <laughs> but I love that picture. Um, <clears throat> so um, then, as I mentioned, I was given a private tour of the White House in 2016, and that's where things really kind of came together for me. 
And this book is really about the food of politics and the politics of food. And as, as, as I put it together, I wondered, what would the narrative arc from George Washington and his troops starving in the, at Valley Forge in the winter of 1777 to the days when squirrel stew and roasted possum were considered the height of fine dining, to space age tang, sanka, and pop tarts in the Kennedy era, to modern kale, taco bowls, and performance enhancing ice cream today, tell us about our commanders in chief, the state of the union, the industrialization of the nation, and ultimately ourselves through the ages. So tonight I'll give you a taste of what I found in the stories of three presidential meals. Now, the first took place on the evening of June 20th, 1790, when Thomas Jefferson invited two blood rivals, Alexander Hamilton and James Had Madison to the, his house in New York City for a secret dinner. This is an actual invite from Jefferson. At the time, Washington, George Washington, was a year into his presidency, and our democracy was more an idea than a functioning political system. Tensions were flaring between Hamilton, the Secretary of State on the left, I'm sorry, the Secretary of Treasury on the left, and Madison, a shrewd Virginia congressman, over how to pay off America's revolutionary war debts and where to locate the nation's capital. These issues seem obscure today, but at heart, they were about money and power. And Jefferson, the Secretary of State, feared their argument would tear the Republic apart. Welcoming Hamilton, who represented the North, and Madison, the South, Jefferson poured each a glass of Hermitage, a fine white wine the French called du et liquoreux, or sweet and liquory, and chatted about farming, architecture, Virginia, France, practically everything but the burning questions that had brought them together that night. In the meantime, mouth-watering aromas suffused the room as Jefferson's slave chef, James Hemings, who had trained with some of Paris's finest cooks, was conjuring a sumptuous meal designed to open the antagonist's minds. Capon and chestnuts simmered in cream, root vegetables roasted in olive oil, beef slow braised in red wine and herbs. Jefferson was our most Epicurean president who had brought Hemings to France when he was the ambassador there. And, and Jefferson was a skilled host who understood how to use food and drink to build consensus. The stakes could not have been higher that night in New York. He wrote, I thought it impossible that reasonable men consulting together coolly could fail to form a compromise, which was to save the union. As the evening wore on, the amalgam of proteins, collagens, and vegetables aided by generous pours of Chambertin, a complex burgundy known as the king of wines, began to work its magic. And slowly, but surely, Hamilton and Madison loosened up and began to talk. Hemings' dessert was a piece de resistance, vanilla ice cream wrapped in warm puff pastry, which gave the startling impression that the cold confection had just emerged from a, from a hot oven. It was a special dessert that Jefferson reserved for the most special occasions. Finally, over snifters of brandy, Madison agreed that Hamilton could impose taxes and build a financial system run by the federal government. In return, Hamilton consented to move the federal capital from New York to Philadelphia for 10 years, while a new federal city was built on a southern site, today's Washington, D.C. Known as the dinner table bargain, the agreement was hailed as a watershed moment in the nation's evolution. And that dinner continues to resonate today. We're still fighting over taxation and the role of, of the federal government, after all. And in the Broadway musical Hamilton, Aaron Burr, who was not invited to the dinner, jealously raps in the song, The Room Where It Happened. Now, Madison and Jefferson are merciless, will hate the sin, love the sinner, but decisions are happening over dinner. No one really knows how the game is played, the art of the trade, how the sausage gets made. We just assume that it happens, but no one else is in the room where it happens. Click, boom, and then it happens. 
I'm not much of a rapper, but there you go. <laughs> this brings us to our second dinner, uh, which demonstrates the triumphs and pitfalls of the presidential palate. Like Jefferson, Franklin D. Roosevelt, obsessed about food and drink. FDR's heart skipped a beat when he was served kippered herring or chipped beef for breakfast, green gumbo or abalone steaks for lunch, buffalo tongue, oyster crabs, or tripe pepper pot for dinner. He used food as a tool of persuasion and constructed menus that were more than simply a list of things to eat. And sometimes his meal took on a theatrical turn with sometimes brilliant results. When King George VI and his wife, Queen Elizabeth, the Duke and Duchess of Windsor embarked on a tour of Canada in 1938, for example, FDR invited them south to what he called a simple picnic at his family mansion in Hyde Park, New York. America was just emerging from the depression at the time and much of the public resented Great Britain for not fully repaying her World War I debts. But Roosevelt worried about Hitler's rise and was determined to rebuild America's special relationship with Great Britain. So he invited the Windsors for lunch and thus began a risky dance. If Roosevelt's gambit backfired, the U.S.-U.K. alliance would sour, entrench American isolationists, and give Hitler a pass to invade Western Europe. But if he succeeded, he might shift the balance of geopolitical power. The challenge was to present the Windsors not as haughty royals who feasted on roast beef and Yorkshire pudding, but as a likable couple that everyday Americans could relate to. After a formal White House dinner and a visit to the 1939's World's Fair, FDR brought the royals to Hyde Park, where, to the public's delight, he served them an all-American hot dog and beer cookout. The hot dogs were served on silver trays, but everyone ate them from paper plates. The king enjoyed his so much that he had a second and washed it down with a cold beer like a regular human being. The New York Times was so astonished that it ran a front page story declaring, King tries hot dog and asks for more, and he drinks beer with them. On the side, FDR quietly promised the king he'd defend British convoys and sink German U-boats and, quote, wait for the consequences. It was a spine-stiffening message for Britain in its time of need. And the hot dog summit helped shift American public opinion in favor of the alliance. And just in time, shortly afterward, German troops blitzkrieged Poland. And in 1941, FDR sent troops into combat. His simple lunch with the Windsors would be hailed as the picnic that won the war. So that's food on a grand scale, but food can also reveal the intimate side of presidential life. And during FDR's 12-year residence in the White House, his meals were laden with political, economic, psychological, and emotional weight. Consider terrapin soup, one of FDR's favorite dishes. He saw it as a bridge to American history, a sign of high culture, and a sensory experience. But his wife, Eleanor, disliked the earthy looks and taste of the turtle soup which the president served with bones and flippers in broth in the turtle's shell. Eleanor preferred to eat dry whole wheat toast for breakfast, almond soup for lunch, and kedgeri, a mix of fish, rice, and eggs for dinner. Mother's a wonderful woman, but she has no appreciation of fine food, Jimmy Roosevelt said. Victuals to her are something to inject into the body as fuel to keep going, to keep it going like gasoline. Eleanor's rationalist diet paid no heed to the flavors, textures, or associations, the emotional pleasure of eating that ignited her husband's senses. Their conflicting palates almost guaranteed marital tension, which was made much worse by their housekeeper, the dreaded Mrs. Nesbitt. Play some scary music now. <laughs> She served the gourmet president the cheapest cuts of meat, wan canned vegetables, curried leftovers, salads, quote unquote, of pineapple slices, rolled in crushed peppermint candy, and the like. I've been getting sweetbread six times a week, FDR grumbled. 
This does not help my relations with foreign powers. I bit two of them yesterday. Ironically, many people came to believe that the Roosevelt White House served some of the worst food ever. Ernest Hemingway described a 1937 dinner as rainwater soup followed by rubber squab, a nice wilted salad, and a cake some admirer had sent, an enthusiastic but unskilled admirer. His wife, Martha Gellhorn, ate sandwiches before flying to Washington. We thought she was crazy, said Hem, but she said the food was always uneatable and everybody ate before they went. I won't be staying there anymore. Eleanor Roosevelt staunchly backed Mrs. Nesbitt, and the most powerful man in the world seemed curiously powerless to direct his own diet. But why? Well, Eleanor never answered that question directly. But here's a hint. In 1918, she discovered Franklin was having an affair with her former social secretary, Lucy Mercer. It was a painful betrayal which dredged up memories of her own father's misbehavior. The Roosevelts contemplated divorce, but in the end stayed together for the sake of family, politics, and money. But it was an armed truce. I have the memory of an elephant, Eleanor said. I can forgive, but I never forget. Some historians believe Eleanor wanted to use Mrs. Nesbitt's horrible meals to set a frugal example during the war but others contend that she used Mrs. Nesbitt's awful meals as a tool of domestic revenge. I'm in the latter camp. <laughs> Our third presidential dinner took place in 1961. After the Depression, two world wars, and Korea, a time when America yearned for something new, polychromatic, and exciting. The Kennedy style was a jazzy reflection of the early 60s, but the zing of their parties was as much a result of careful design as it was the beneficiary of good timing. JFK was the front man, movie star, handsome, rich, witty, and at 43, the youngest elected president in history. While he was partial to New England clam chowder and ice cream, his wife, Jackie, was a demure, quietly willful 34-year-old gourmet with an instinct for the drama, power, and sheer fun of entertaining at the White House. A Francophile, she modeled her soirees on Louis XIV, the Sun King, who used entertaining to broker deals, seal treaties, and keep his friends close and enemies closer. Fine dining was central to Jackie's vision. She hired the French chef René Verdon, and raised the cultural bar at the White House to a height that has rarely been matched before or since. She hosted a series of famous parting parties, including this one, the so-called Brains Dinner, not because they ate brains, but because the, the, all of the guests were Nobel laureates. You see uh, Pearl Buck on the left there and uh, uh, Robert Frost on the right. They held wild shindigs aboard the presidential yacht and Jackie arranged uh, for the loan of the Mona Lisa from France for the first time in history, which drew a million visitors to Washington and, not coincidentally, delivered a publicity bonanza to the Kennedy administration. Their parties were a form of soft power, a political and diplomatic seduction, and they were immensely successful. Perhaps no meal epitomized this better than their state dinner of July 11th, 1961. Inspired by a party they attended the, at the Versailles Palace outside of Paris, Jackie was determined to create a similarly magical event in Washington. But where and for who? Well, it happened that General Ayub Khan, of, the president of Pakistan, was scheduled to visit. Khan was an important ally, and Jackie found just the spot for her state dinner to end all state dinners. Mount Vernon, George Washington's Virginia plantation, due south of Washington on the Potomac. Uh, it's a fabulous place. If none of you have been there, I, I highly recommend you go. The fact that a state dinner had never been held outside of the White House or that Mount Vernon had minimal electricity and restrooms 
didn't cloud the first lady's vision. She had a tent big enough to accommodate 132 guests erected on the lawn. René Verdon cooked his meal, a poulet chasseur or chicken in a mushroom sauce at the White House, uh, and then trucked it to Mount Vernon and reheated it on site. But as the clock ticked down, portable toilets set amid poison ivy had to be moved. Mosquitoes held their own state dinner on the, worker, on the workmen. When they were sprayed with insecticide, the poisonous gas wafted toward Verdun's meal that was cooking on the stove, and he threatened to quit. The staff teetered on the edge of nervous collapse. But smiling like a sphinx, Jackie insisted in a quiet little phrase of iron, recalled her social secretary, Letitia Baldridge, of course it can be done. The guests arrived by flotilla on the Potomac, including a, P a PT boat, just like the one Jack captained during the Second World War. And as the sunlight faded to pastel tones, ladies in diaphanous gowns flitted across the lawn like butterflies. Candlelight flashed off their diamond earrings and a cloud of fireflies added a touch of surreal beauty. Behind this beguiling scene brewed a Cold War intrigue that few guests were aware of. Just before dinner, Kennedy walked Khan through George Washington's garden, alone. Khan was furious that the U.S. had given India, his sworn enemy, a billion dollars in aid without telling the Pakistanis. So Khan had terminated the CIA's use of his secret air bases. But that night at Mount Vernon, JFK's charm and Jackie's sublime mise-en-scene convinced Khan to allow U.S. planes to once again fly over China to monitor its nuclear program and parachute insurgents into Tibet. And the personal bond formed by the two leaders that night proved useful when China invaded India right in the midst of our own Cuban Missile Crisis. The Kennedy State Dinner at Mount Vernon was an unprecedented, high risk, perfectly executed and run unrepeated event that indeed proved to be a magical evening. So why should we care about the meals and the food policies of the White House? Well, the table has traditionally been considered a neutral space where weapons are put aside, leaders get to know each other as human beings rather than as stick figures, and people can disagree agreeably, even sworn enemies like Hamilton and Madison. The president is our eater in chief. He sets an example and the public pays attention. When Barack and Michelle Obama modeled healthy eating, Many people planted, planted gardens and began to exercise more. But when Donald Trump hosted a burger banquet in the state dining room, people ate more fast food. The bully pulpit is powerful indeed. Breaking bread is a fundamental human act. We all have to eat to survive after all, even the president. And when we eat together, it releases endorphins, the feel good chemicals that reinforce our good behaviors. So not only do we enjoy eating together, we seem to need to eat together, even if we disagree with each other, which is a useful survival strategy. Such communal meals have been a launch pad for the American dream for nearly 250 years, and few places on earth rival the White House as a place to eat. There, the literal president's table, whether it's this bipartisan group, of rivals in the private dining room or a banquet table at a state dinner is a practical necessity. It's a place to eat. But the metaphorical president's table encompasses many meanings. It's a symbol of the nation, its bounty, and the multiplicity of voices and identities of its citizens. It's a diplomatic and cultural stage, a communal watering hole, if you will. Lately, we faced unsettled times, and the deals once made in the, Senate, in the Senate dining room or at the cocktail parties that have held Washington together basically forever are withering, and people have been pulling their chairs away from the, com the communal table. Yet at the end of the day, the president's table is ours, the electorate's. 
For we voters are responsible for who sits there, what they eat, and why. I remain optimistic that sharing food and drink around the communal table is a vital, essential means of connection. Though it isn't always easy, we look to our presidents for leadership and must hope or insist that they inspire us to pull our chairs back to the nation's table, sit down, and break bread together again. Thank you, and bon appétit. Alex, thank you so much. Um, that was, um, your words were delicious, and the talk was so, so savory. Um, uh, again, I, th I think you've written a masterpiece and as wonderful a talk as you just gave, which was wonderful to, to read your actual words are incredible in there. So uh, also uh, in, in the past, somebody wrote in that it sounds like you're giving a book promotion when we had an author on. Well, uh, actually he was right. I am giving a book promotion. This is our payback to our speakers who who do our programs for free. But uh, anyway, I do, in the notice that you were sent today, uh, it does give a link on how, if you want to order the book, of course, you can always go to Amazon or anywhere you want, but there are several links in the promotion, in the in the uh, piece we sent out today about the program. Um, we're, I did ask at the beginning, mentioned the beginning, uh, I want to know how on earth can you give some inkling on how you did this massive, massive amount of research. There's even health tips in there uh, about healthy eating that are woven into what they ate at the White House. Uh, can you can you say what what where did you go for your research? How did you do it? I won't ask you. By the way, I won't ask you how you wrote this and wove everything together. I figured out how you did it. Again, massive amount of research. Um, and and tons of talent. So that's that's the way you did it. Anyway, Alex, how how the hell did you get all this information compiled? Well, thank you for that lovely uh, response, Scott. I appreciate it. And I'll just add, if people uh, buy the book uh, and would like a signed book plate from me, I'd be more than happy to send you one. Uh, I could probably it might be easiest to send them to Scott. Um, or I can send them to you directly, but you can um, write to me via my website, which is alexprudom.com. And uh, I can't respond, I can't promise to respond immediately, but I'll do them as quickly as I can and get them out. Um, and, um, you know, this is a book that a lot of people have given as a president, a present, <laughs> a presidential present uh, uh, to people, to friends, to family members who enjoy history and politics and food. Um, on the on the on the food note, I'll, I'll add that there are ten presidential recipes in the back of the book. Uh, each has a little story behind it, um, and also in the conclusion, I tell you about um, how I put on my own state dinner. Um, I was trying desperately to get invited to a state dinner while writing the book, uh, but the Trumps only had two of them, and they did not in, uh, invite me. So I had to put my own state dinner on. So I uh, hired a former White House chef, a guy named uh, John Mueller, who's a wonderful guy, uh, to come to Washington, uh, where we uh, set up camp in, a, in a, an old historical mansion right around the corner from the White House. And he cooked a presidential meal uh, using four uh, courses that had all been used in the White House for, for actual presidents and their diplomatic guests. So we started with uh, uh, a wonderful uh, uh Gar a green salad uh, uh, with Amish cheeses because he comes from Pennsylvania. Uh, we moved on to a delicious uh, Scottish salmon um, with a horseradish crust uh, and a medley of vegetables. Um, and, uh, oh, I forgot to mention the mushroom soup. We had wild mushroom soup. That was a fantastic. Um, and then we finished up with a chocolate bomb with ro raspberry sauce. And it was just, uh, you know, it was a chocolate with raspberry. It was fantastic. <laughs> and uh, so each of those dishes has a story behind it as well. So if you get to the back of the book, you'll find a whole lot of stuff about um, the, the actual food of the president's and 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 why some of these dishes have real historical resonance uh, and humor. 
Um, and at that party, uh, I had 10 guests who were people who had worked at the White House, um, including Betty Monkman, who had been the, the, the former chief curator at the White House, who knew a lot, um, and uh, or people who had covered it for the Washington Post or uh, food historians, what have you. And we had a fabulous dinner and a discussion about state dinners, why they are important and remain re relevant in the 2023. Uh, uh, the first one was held in 1874 by Ulysses Grant uh, for King Kalakaua of the Sandwich Islands, which we now call Hawaii. And he set the pattern for the state dinners that still exist today. Um, and so th that was the thing that got me interested in this book. And so um, uh, it sort of begins and ends with state dinners. Um, now, Scott, when you were off um, in your bunker, uh, I did discuss a bit about how I put the book together, but I'll, I'll briefly run through it again, once again for those that missed it, because um, I see some people have arrived uh, since we've been talking. Um, I began in the fall of 2018, um, inspired by not only my family, which has a uh, 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 populated by people who love to cook and eat and argue over politics and history at the dining table, uh, one of whom is Julia Child, my great aunt, um, who made a couple of television documentaries about state dinners, one in 1967 with LBJ and the other in 76 with George, uh, Gerald Ford and Queen Elizabeth. Uh, which inspired me to look at the greater subject of the food of the White House. And in 2016, I was invited to a, uh, a luncheon and a, a private tour at the White House, which really brought the history alive for me in a way that I wasn't expecting. It was a kind of an emotional experience. And that's actually not uncommon. People often have an emotional experience walking into the White House. Um, a guard told me that uh, some people break into tears, others start laughing and can't stop. Uh, because they're sort of overwhelmed by the experience. Uh, one guy uh, got sick into a, a planter. Uh, the people just get get loopy. Some people pass out, um, and and then and I never would have understood that had I not experienced a strong emotion myself. Uh, and in fact, Harry Truman used to say that the White House was haunted, and the ghosts were moving things around there. Um, and uh, so, uh, thus inspired, I began to report. I uh, visited some of the presidential homes. I went to the Library of Congress and the Smithsonian. I uh, did a lot of interviews with people, experts. I read a lot. Uh, there's a tsunami of uh, information about the presidents. And the hardest part for me was to decide what not to use in the book. Uh, so there's a lot left on the cutting room floor. Um, as a history nerd, I went down various uh, dark alleys that led to nowhere, or I just decided that uh, they didn't reach my criteria. And my criteria for for stories that would be included um, really came down to picking the most well-known presidents so that a greater uh, audience would understand the book and also trying to find the most compelling food stories and, and, and the stories that told us about the evolution of the nation and also the presidents as um, multi-dimensional human beings with sometimes quirky tastes uh, and odd behaviors. Um, and, uh, I just fell in love with this subject and I just, it was really fun. It was a lot of work, as you said, Scott, but it was a lot of fun too. Um, and I was hoping to have it done in two to two and a half years. And I was well on my way, uh, when suddenly COVID hit and brought everything to a screeching halt. And so I had to just, um, uh, uh, use what I'd already gathered and, you know, uh, uh, rely on sources who would send me things through the mail or by email, uh, and I was able to finish the book. And then we had a second COVID problem, which was the supply chain issue. Uh, we literally didn't have the printing presses or the paper or the delivery trucks to, to produce the book. So it was delayed again uh, by about a year. And um, uh, But that was okay because I was able to fine tune the book, uh, add a few things, cut a few things. Um, and uh, it came out this past February, right before President's Day. And I've been talking about it ever since. So that's the long answer to your short question. And Kathy, uh, if you'll now proceed with the uh, the questions on chat. Now, I do want to say that, yeah, I, I was watching TV and I missed that part because I wanted to see where their tornado was headed. 
And now that I'm back, the sun is shining and there's literally was a beautiful rainbow in the park uh, behind me. Uh, I'm I'm on the north side in Chicago, so uh, I have a be be beautiful view of the lake and the park. So there was a, just a beautiful rainbow behind me. So anyway, we're safe now. Anyway, Kathy, if you'd care to proceed. Thanks a lot. OK, yeah, it's been an interesting evening, more exciting than normal. Um, OK, is there a citation for fast food sales increasing after the Trump dinner? Yes, there is. Uh, I have an extensive uh, note section. And if you look in there, you'll see that there was a study done uh, of this uh, that I cite. And I believe it was a an academic in Chicago who who pursued that. Uh, and I thought that was, a, it was such an interesting fact uh that you know and it indicates that the public really pays attention to what the president says and does um and eats and um th this is one of the subjects that one of the things that i love about this subject but it, it, when i talk to some academics about this um it turns out that food is very suggest suggestive to us um when we see somebody wearing a piece of clothing that's similar to ours, we think, oh, you know, that's a nice shirt, but nothing more than that. But when we see somebody eating something that we like to eat, it goes into our prehistoric brain and it says, ah, that person's eating the thing I like, therefore we must be from the same tribe. That person is safe, I like them. And so when Reagan uh, ate his jelly beans or, uh, Bill Clinton or Donald Trump ate burgers. Um, uh, it was a similar message that they didn't even have to vocalize. It was sort of the message really was, I like this food, you like this food, vote for me. Um, and it was it was a very subliminal but powerful message. Um, and so this is the kind of thing that I got into in this book that uh, I thought kind of gave it multiple dimensions and, and made it uh, particularly interesting. I know this is not, well, okay, nonetheless, I will ask. Did you invite Trump to your state dinner? <laughs> I did not because uh, they uh, didn't really respond to my queries about going to his state dinner. I wish I had been able to. Uh, I would have loved to have had Trump at my state dinner. Uh, I, I would think he would be an interesting guest to have. Um, you know, love him or hate him his burger banquet was a was a was a really smart move uh, politically because uh as i was just talking about it's a food is a powerful message um and also it was a um a sort of an in-your-face thing that he liked to do uh which offended people uh or, or traditionalists on on uh both ends of the political spectrum i i quote uh a, a an old-time Republican conservative uh, who was completely offended by the burger banquet um, uh, because she felt it wasn't dignified enough for the White House. And, um, and you know, even the football players were a little taken back. This, the, the burger banquet was, was for the Clemson football team, uh, which had won the national championship. Um, but it was really designed as a message to his voters. And it was kind of a brilliant move uh, because once you see those images, you can't unsee them uh, and because it was so shocking. And, and the pictures went around the world in 30 seconds and uh, became um, some of the signature images uh, from his presidency. So um, you have to give it to him. Mission accomplished. Um, I, I remember this. This actually was a comment that came up when Adrian Miller came when he was talking about the black chefs in the White House. One of the comments he made at the time, and it's I continued to think about it, there's not that many cookbooks from, let's say, White House chefs. I know there's that book, like, was it eight, the 1890s, that silver? I have two copies of that book. Both of them fall up, are falling apart. So, you know, there's never been that many cookbooks. Do you understand that? Well, uh, I don't know if I agree with Adrian on that. Um, by the way, I, his book is fun to read. It's all about the black cooks at the White House. Um, and he spent quite a bit of time researching it. Um, and I talk about the the slave chefs, uh, uh, especially in the early days uh, and, and some of the black chefs later. But um, there are quite a few, if you start digging, there's there are quite a few books written by former White House cooks and chefs uh, and everybody else who served there. <laughs> um, I think there's 
you know, you have to sign a, a, an agreement to show the White House your manuscript before you publish it so that they can ed edit out anything that they don't like. But um, I found quite a few, and those were useful to my research, and I quote from them. Um, uh, Walter Scheib, for example, was a, a chef who worked for, um, uh, he was hired by the Clintons, and he lasted through the middle of the George W. Bushes. Um, he was a big personality. Um, much as the presidents are. Uh, and he loved that proximity to power that the job gave him and the the pressure of performing, uh, you, know, and, you know, when you had a state dinner um, or even a cabinet meeting or a picnic on the lawn. Um, the, the, the White House job is, uh, the executive chef job is not very well paid, but it is extremely prestigious and it's a lot of work. And some people like it and some people don't. Um, Henry Holler, who was the longest serving executive chef, he served for five administrations. <clears throat> he was actually brought on by Lyndon Johnson um, when uh, the Kennedy chef, René Verdon, quit because uh, Johnson wanted um, to serve chili and barbecue. And uh, Verdon, you know, the proper French chef, said, Well, we do not serve ribs to the ladies in white gloves. Uh, and so he quit and opened a restaurant in, in uh, San Francisco. Um, and uh, uh, Henry Holler, who was a, a, an Austrian, uh, a Swiss, uh, who was trained in Austria and France, uh, a wonderful, unflappable guy, uh, became a good friend of Julia's. You saw that photograph of Julia with Henry Holler. Um, served uh, uh, for five administrations. Um, the current chef, Christetta Comerford, has been there for four. She's from the Philippines originally. Again, a very talented chef you know, happy to make a ham and cheese sandwich or a, a splendid meal for a state dinner. She can do it all. Uh, I tried to get her to come to my state dinner. She couldn't make it. Um, and I think they, they they keep the chefs under pretty close watch at the White House. Maybe once they retire, people like John Mueller are welcome to do as they wish. Uh, John Mueller wrote a book. Um, uh, René Verdon, as I mentioned, uh, uh, wrote a book with... Uh, or he helped uh, Letitia Baldridge write a book about the Kennedy years. He provided the recipes um, and so on. And so there's there are a number of books. And if you look out there, you'll find them. And there's also something called uh, the President's Cookbook uh, that has recipes from many of the administration. So if you're interested in this kind of stuff, uh, look at my bibliography uh, and my notes section, and you'll see that I consulted quite a few books. Oh, yeah, I, I will do that. Um... I hope that you might discuss the 1856 celebratory banquet for the newly elected, elected President James Buchanan, at which several congressmen were deadly poisoned. Was it a conspiracy? It might have been the most significant presidential dinner. I believe it was at the National Hotel in Washington. I did not uh, do, I did not cover that dinner. Uh, or Buchanan. He's a lesser known president. Um, and I don't know about the, the poisoning story has been, has been disputed. So I decided to leave that one aside. Uh, the other poisoning story that is even better known is Zachary Taylor, uh, who um, on a hot day gave a speech and then drank uh, iced milk and ate some cherries and expired shortly afterwards. And the theory was that pro-slavery forces had poisoned his milk. Um, and this was a theory that had more credence than the Buchanan dinner poisoning story. And in fact, I believe it was in the 1980s, they exhumed Zachary Taylor's body and tested it for cyanide. And it came up negative. But they didn't test it for other poisons. So there's still a, a question. Uh, but uh, most people think Actually, he was probably poisoned by the uh, untreated water that was uh, drawn from the Potomac River and was polluted uh, by human waste, among other things, um, uh, and and poisoned quite a few people. And he was on, on that hot day, um, and he got something from the water, and it and it and it ended his life, unfortunately. Um, but you know, the the white the, the question of poisoning is something people always ask about. And I can tell you that for many years, there was a tradition of the public sending the White House gifts. Um, 
most famously giant cheeses from places like New York State. Uh, Jefferson received a 250 pound cheese from a, a New York dairy man, uh, which was allegedly a tribute to the president, but was really a sort of a self-promotion by the dairy guy. Uh, same thing with um, Andrew Jackson. He received an enormous cheese. Um, and uh, when the he was a populist, a bit like Trump, and when the crowd came to the White House to eat the cheese, uh, they'd had a bit to drink and they attacked the cheese and uh, then attacked the White House. Uh, they smushed the cheese into the rugs. They ripped down the drapes. Uh, it was uh, uh, the, the White House smelled of cheese for days afterwards, and they had to uh, bring in a fumigator to get rid of it. <laughs> um, the the other famous gift was the the White House salmon, so called, that was brought from uh, Maine uh, every year. Uh, the first salmon caught uh, was sent down as a tribute to the president, and um, that tradition lasted until George H. W. Bush, um, after which the salmon population was decimated by dams and pollution. Um, and these are Atlantic salmon, and the Atlantic salmon are are still uh, in bad shape, but the, the dam's been taken down and the water's been cleaned. So the hope is that they'll come back and we can revive that. Uh, I certainly hope we can revive that uh, tradition of the, the presidential salmon. But um, even before 9-11, but certainly after 9-11, the White House took strict security concerns with food. And now it's virtually impossible to poison the president. Uh, they source food from places that don't even know that they're providing for the White House. Uh, they're very careful about who has access to the food. Um, the chefs are, needless to say, vetted very carefully. Um, and so, uh, especially since 9-11, it's been, it's been really uh, uh, locked down, uh, and it's almost impossible to, to, to poison the president. Um, having said that, a number of presidents have been shot, and uh, that's still always a possibility, and there's other ways of assassinating the president. So uh, the danger is always there. Perhaps you can elaborate just a little bit. You said, can you provide any perspective on the process the White House uses in procuring food from suppliers? Because you say it's a virtually impossible, but is that- Well, what they do that? is um, there is a government office uh, that procures food for all sorts of different government buildings. And that can mean everything from a warehouse building to the White House. And the- uh, providers don't know where their food is going. They just give it to the government. Um, now, the chefs can order special things like a perfectly ripe peach or a, a, a wonderful wine. Um, they can make a special order, but even then, the providers uh, don't know that it's going to the president's palate. Uh, so uh, they're very careful about covering their tracks. Um, and if anybody blabs that they've, uh, they've, um, provided food or drink to the White House, they're immediately cut off and they're never used again. And that's happened a couple of times um, that people think that they figured out that they're providing food to the president and they say something and then that's the end of their contract. So um, it's a, they don't mess around. They're, they're very careful, careful about it. Clearly, clearly. Now, that, that if you don't mind going back to that book, the one from the 1890s, was that sort of like a community cookbook? Because it's pretty extensive and it's pretty thick. Yeah, I mean, I have it right here in my bookshelf. Um, but by the way, somebody commented about the, you know, the people get knocked off if they reveal that they're any, somebody commented, so it's the reverse of having a royal warrant. In this case, <laughs> you, don't, you don't even want to brag. <laughs> exactly. Uh, here is this original book. It's called The Original White House Cookbook, 1887 edition. And it's got this gold embossed cover and it's got uh, a gazillion and one recipes in it um, with some not particularly interesting photographs uh, and old uh, etchings and so on. Uh, but it's actually really fun to read through. Um, here I just opened up to bread griddle cakes, rice griddle cakes, potato griddle cakes, green corn griddle cakes, huckleberry griddle cakes, French griddle cakes, and so on and so forth. So um, here's it's almost like the, uh, the joy of cooking for its era. Pretty much. And then there's a whole table in the back about 
cooking times and you know it gets sort of technical um and you know how to how to wash certain things and clean clean fish and prepare meat and so uh if you're interested in historical cooking it's kind of fun to read um the other one that i like is called uh, the president's cookbook by poppy cannon with patricia brooks uh poppy cannon was a well-known food writer uh and um she uh wrote this book of uh, presidential recipes it goes up to uh let's see it goes up to lbj and so uh and it includes texas fried chicken and things like that and so it, this is a fun book she's got a few anecdotes in here um uh and that this was a useful book to me because uh she covered some of the same stories i did and it was interesting to see how she wrote about events that i wrote about but i had the benefit of time and history to kind of look at them from a different angle um but uh it's that's quite an entertaining book so if you're interested in those 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 books uh, again take a look at my bibliography and my notes and you'll see uh, where i drew my my recipes and my anecdotes from Absolutely. By the way, how old is that book that you just referenced? Or for well, the, the, so LBJ was the last president, oh, oh, okay. you know, so mid 60s, I guess. Uh, yeah, this yeah. was right 1968. So okay. Julia uh, filmed her dinner, her state dinner with LBJ in 67, and it aired in 68. So Julia may have seen this book. I don't know. Probably. Uh, if there's not any more questions, we're probably ready to wrap up. Okay. Very interesting. Thank you. Well, thank you all. This was a lot of fun. I appreciate it. I uh, hope you stay safe. Um, and uh, bon appetit. And also, there are we included three recipes in the notices that we we send out. So there are links if if you check your email. But there are links to three recipes. Uh, one from Lady Bird Johnson with chili, uh, a martini. I think Roosevelt's martini or FDR's something FDR's reverse martini which uh I grew up with because it was a favorite drink of Julia and Paul Childs as well uh famous drink in our family uh and it's essentially a martini but the the proportions are reversed so there's more vermouth than than vodka uh and uh it's uh the Julia always said she liked a reverse martini because you can have two of them <laughs> <laughs> and there was one more recipe that that we included too and uh but anyway Arthur washington's cherries uh, oh yeah preserved cherries that's a fun thing to match easy you can make that with kids and it's uh you can put it on ice cream or yogurt or uh it, eat it with a savory dish it's 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 fun to do because you pit the cherries together and it's it's very simple uh but the original recipe for that had so much sugar in it yes. that it made my teeth hurt just to read it and i include both the original and my updated version with much less sugar <laughs> Well, well, again, thank you. Tonight was like a fantasy. In some ways, it was like like uh, a scene out of The Wizard of Oz, including <laughs> Tornado. And uh, thank you again. And sure hope that we get a chance to meet in person. Hopefully, you might be at the Brooklyn Awards Ceremony for the International Association of Culinary Professionals in September. So uh, that's, that's going to be announced by that group soon. But you have heads up information. And thank you and bon appetit, Alex. Okay, thank you so much, Scott.